One of the keys to metabolic flexibility is optimizing blood sugar and helping reduce your insulin levels. So go back to prior YouTube videos I've done on insulin and blood sugar, but these are common questions I receive across social media on nearly a daily basis. So reducing insulin focuses on improving satiety. So you really need to restructure your meals. And by this, I mean, you want to make sure that the macronutrients you're using in your diet are allowing our bodies to use our own fat as fuel versus ingested food. So you want to make sure you're thinking about animal-based protein and healthy fats. You want to remove processed carbohydrates. I know this is a sticking point for many. It does not mean carbs are bad. I don't want anyone taking away from this lesson that I'm suggesting that you shouldn't consume some carbohydrates in your diet, but you don't want it to be stuff that involves flour and sugar. You wanna eat more nutrient dense whole foods like I mentioned animal based protein and healthy fats. These will help reduce cravings and your appetite. Protein is the most dense macronutrient, meaning the more protein you eat, the less likely you are to overeat. You will reduce your energy intake which will help push fat loss and reduce your insulin levels. Best examples of meals. I get these questions all the time. I love steak and broccoli, chicken and spinach, a large salad with fish or shellfish, even hard boiled eggs, bison, antelope, get creative. I think it's really critical that you experiment with different types of proteins and vegetables, non-starchy vegetables to find what works best. And don't be afraid to add in some grass-fed butter, ghee, etc. You want to stay away from processed carbs, especially cakes, cookies, bars, which we affectionately refer to as carbohydrate bars. Thank you to Dr. Ken Berry for that. You also want to be reading food labels. The two things that you can manage to stay away from are hidden sugars and then seed oils. So soybean, canola, safflower, cottonseed are all bad. To add to this, you want to make sure that you are taking five to 10 minute walks after eating meals, which can really be very helpful. I'm talking about a very short walk with yourself, with your kid, with your by yourself, with your dogs. You can also check your blood sugar before you eat your meal and then two hours afterwards. Now I'm in the midst of reading a really interesting book that is called Big Fat Keto Lies. And so you want your pre-meal sugars to be less than 100, ideally 80 to 90 at most. And if higher, I take a walk and then try to recheck. So if your sugars are over 100, 110, you should really not be eating a meal. You should try to wait till they come back down. You want to see your post meal sugars less than 140 and see them peak and start dropping back to baseline two hours after a meal. So if you start at 90 and then it goes up to 120 and starts to come back down, that's what you want to see. The data driven fasting suggests avoiding carbs that raise your blood sugar by more than 40 milligrams per deciliter and that there's no correlation between a stable blood sugar and fat loss. So don't focus as much on keeping your blood sugar like flat. You want to see peak and then come back down. Instead, focus on your pre-meal values and your body mass index. Now, I want to give an example. I have been wearing a continuous glucose monitor for the last several months. What I found is that I cannot consume plantains. When I eat them, my blood sugar bumps up to 160 and comes back down. So one of the most powerful predictors of metabolic health is really your morning blood sugar levels. So if your blood sugar is more than mid 90s, so between 80 and 95, fine. If it's 110, 120, you really need to work on that first. And lastly, you want to focus on satiety. I think this is something that I try to continue to weave into all of my lectures that I'm sharing on YouTube, but these are ways you can help mitigate the insulin response and help manage your blood sugar more successfully. Have a great day.